Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unizor Education. Um, we continue talking about um, conservation laws in uh, theory of relativity. So the last lecture was about momentum and we basically came up with a formula for momentum in theory of relativity, relativistic momentum, uh, which is slightly different, well, not slightly different, than the definition of momentum in Newtonian mechanics. And we needed it to basically preserve the integrity of uh, conservation law of momentum. And I will use this formula today. Now, today we will talk about energy, primarily about kinetic energy. We will gradually go to conservation of energy. So today we will talk about, about uh, kinetic en energy. And basically, again, we will come up with a formula which defines kinetic energy in theory of relativity. So, the, today's lecture is about relativistic kinetic energy. Now, this lecture is part of the course called Relativity for All, presented on unizor.com. I suggest you to watch this lecture from this website because every lecture has very detailed notes, like a textbook. Um, and then it's a course, basically, which means I always depend on something which I have already covered before in, in, in most of the lectures. Like today, for, for example, we will use the formula which I have derived yesterday for um, momentum. Now, the same website contains a prerequisite course called Math for Teens. Uh, and, for example, today I will use calculus and you definitely have to know calculus, you have to know vector algebra to, to study physics. Um, so, uh, the website is totally free, no sign-in is necessary, although you might. Um, no strings attached, no financial involvement, etc. Completely free. No advertisement, by the way, no ads. So, all concentrated on studying. All right, so let me start. Um, so today we're talking about kinetic energy uh, and primarily relativistic kin kinetic energy. Now, let's start from force. Again, according to second law of Newton, the force is mass times acceleration. Acceleration is first derivative of um, the velocity. Actually, these are vectors, to tell you the truth, but we will probably consider only one direction, so it doesn't really matter. Um, so it's m times du by dt. So u is velocity, and du by dt is first derivative, which gives acceleration. Now, in Newtonian mechanics, mass is constant, so I can put it under differential. I will put it here. And this is momentum as defined in uh, classical Newtonian mechanics. M times U, mass times speed is momentum. Now. Today, this is very important. Again, I will refer to the previous lecture about momentum. We are talking about relativistic momentum, and that's why retaining this formula, I have to express F, force, in terms of relativistic momentum, and that would be relativistic force. So, momentum, as a function of t, by the way, of the time, uh, in theory of relativity is okay, first of all I put dependence on time and obviously speed depends on time and therefore momentum depends on time when we are talking about force we no longer talk about constant speed it's not a uniform movement it's accelerated movement and not necessarily uh, a acceleration is supposed to be constant because f is not supposed to be constant f can be variable as well so this is the definition where gamma is 1 over square root 
1 minus u squared divided by c squared, and this is function of time. Now, this is no longer a vector in this particular case. You can consider this as a scalar product of vector by itself, or basically the length of this vector squared. So that's what my uh, expression for uh, momentum uh, in theory of relativity is. And I have to use it here, basically, to define relativistic force, right? So, now, force is equal to, as a function of t, as a function of time, it's equal to derivative by time of this expression, which is m0 u of t, um, oh, I can put vector here and here, it doesn't matter, square root of 1 minus u of t square divided by c square. c is the speed of light, of course, you remember that, right? So that's my expression for the force. Great. Now, um, from the force, I have to somehow get to energy. Now, the energy, if you remember, is definitely related to work which the force is doing. So, let's just assume that we have an object. This is x direction, y, z. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not talking about y or z dimensions, it's only one dimensional movement. The force, this is the object at t is equal to zero at the moment, at the origin of coordinates. Now this is location of object of, at, at time t, and the force is acting only um, in the direction of x-axis. So my movement is always during, uh, it, it, it's always along the x-axis. So that's simpler. Okay? So if I have some kind of force and some kind of a speed with which we are actually moving as a function of time, of course, speed. For example, if force is constant, then acceleration is constant, and speed would be uh, gradually increasing with uniform acceleration. But F that doesn't necessarily have to be constant, doesn't really matter. Okay, so what happens during certain period of time? Let's say I have this period of time, capital T. During this time, the force is acting, and the um, the object at time uh, zero was in the beginning of this, uh, in the origin of the coordinate, and then it's moving during this thing. What is um, the work which uh, my force is doing? Well, let's just do very simple. Let's just have a tiny t plus dt. So, tiny piece of this trajectory from t to t plus dt. During this time, we obviously, as usually done in uh, calculus and physics, we are assuming the force during this infinitesimal um, period of time is constant and it's equal to f of t. Then we will multiply it by the length of this um, of this piece, and uh, which is actually dx, right? It's differential of the length, so it's from t to t plus d d dt, it's a dx. And we also assume that the speed during this period of time, infinitesimal period of time, is constant and equal to u of t. That's the speed. And now we can calculate the differential of work which is done only during this period of time. So this differential of work, which is actually amount of kinetic energy which uh, our object gained during this period of time because the force is moving it faster and faster, right? So 
the work which force is, is doing is exactly equal to increment of the kinetic energy. So it would be dK if you wish. So what is it equal to? Well, it's equal to force at, the t at this time times distance dx. Okay. Now, we know what it is. We know the description of the force, which is d by dt m0 u of t divided by square root 1 minus u square of t divided by c square. Now, what is dx? Well, if I know the speed, then would be speed times differential of time, right? Speed times the, during this time, this speed is constant, so u times dt would be my, um, uh, my dx, piece of the trajectory during which the force was acting. Okay, so what do I have to do now to find out a total kinetic energy which the object moving along x-axis from zero to time is equal to t? Well, I have to just integrate it. So, kinetic energy and we can actually use something like subscript zero times capital T it's equal to work with the same subscript from zero to time T it's equal to integral from zero to capital T of this thing okay well don't get scared actually that's something relatively simple so let me just get the middle part, we don't really need it. So we are talking about integral of this from zero to capital T and that would be my kinetic energy which object has gained on the uh, during the time period from zero to capital T. Okay, that's what it is. Now, first of all, my notes for this lecture are very detailed about how to take this integral, but I'll just spend a couple of minutes basically explaining what it is. Now, this d per dt is related to this fraction, okay? Now, recall the integration by parts. You remember that if you have two functions, f of x times g of x and you want to take the derivative it would be derivative of f times g plus derivative of g times, uh, uh, t times f Now, if you want to integrate it, it will be sum of integrals. Okay? Now, if you want to uh, consider this thing, I have to put brackets around it. So, this is integral of derivative. And what is integral of derivative? It's the original function, right? Original function is the product of f times g. Well, the only thing if my integral is 
um, definitive, let's say, from A to B, uh, and this is probably dx, uh, and this is from A to B, and this is from A to B, and this is dx, and this is dx. So I will probably have to put it from A to B. So it's original function in these limits, which means this function of B minus this function of A. Remember the formula of Newton Leibniz? Okay. And that's equal to, again, integral A, B, F of X, G of X, DX, plus integral of B, F times G times G uh, times DX. From which follows that this thing, and that's where the formula of integration by parts is, integral from A to B of F gx dx is equal to f of x times g of x in the limits from a to b minus so this one is equal to this minus this minus integral from a to b of f of x g of x the yes derivative by dx we will use this formula because it looks exactly like what we have. Derivative times the function. Derivative times the function is equal to this function times this function in the limits which I was indicating minus integral of derivative of this function times this. We change the derivation, right? Okay, so I did it quite accurately in my notes and I will try to do it I'm not sure I have time, I will check right now but it's really very very straightforward so I will do just one interaction here so this k from 0 to capital T is equal to I have to take this function under the derivation times this function, which is m0 times u square of t, u and u, that's why u square, divided by square root 1 minus u square of t divided by c square in the limits from 0 to t minus integral from 0 to t I have to take this function as is and derivative of this. So it would be m0 u of t divided by square root 1 minus u square of t divided by c square times u dt. Okay. <coughs> All right. Now, this thing is du. Differential of the function is equal to derivative of that function times the uh, differential of argument, right? differential of f of x is equal to derivative times differential of argument. So I can replace this with du. Now what I will do, I will consider my u of t as substituted independent variable. So I can do this um, integral m0 u divided by square root 1 minus u square divided by c square du. And the only thing which I have to do, I have to change the limits of integration. 
from 0 to u of t, the maximum value. Okay. Now this integral again can be simplified even further because instead of u times du I can put d of 1 minus u squared divided by c squared and I need some differential of this well 1 doesn't matter there is a minus so I have to change the sign of the whole thing uh, and then I have to, it would be 2 times u, uh, so I have to multiply it by, by c squared. And uh, do I have to divide it by 2? I think so. Alright. Yes. So with this multiplier, I can replace du um, on, on d of this expression. Why this expression? Because it's exactly the same as this expression. And again, I can take the integral. Now, using this technique, now the integral of d, uh, let's say, uh, whatever the some kind of dz, whatever, by square root of z. I mean, you know what that is, actually, right? That's uh, the, the derivative of square root is 1 over 2 square roots, right? So you will easily uh, take this integral. And again, I don't want to go into all the details because I might make a mistake and it will take uh, the time. But in the notes, I really do it all very accurately and I will just give you the result of this. The result of this is whenever you will do this and this and all the manipulations, the result of this is that it's equal to a very interesting formula. It's uh, m zero c squared divided by square root of one minus u of t square divided by c square. T is that limit of time minus m u c square. This is a very interesting formula. Now, this is the result of this thing, basically. Now let's analyze it. First of all, you see the resemblance, well, not resemblance, but part of this formula is something which looks very familiar. Well, the most famous formula in, um, in physics, that energy is equal to m0 times c squared, where m0 is a rest mass. By the way, I used m0 everywhere here, just to make sure that we are talking about rest mass, because Again, in the last lecture, I was, last lecture I was talking about so-called relativistic mass, which is mass divided by this um, by this square root, which is basically gamma, uh, the Lorentz uh, factor. So I don't want to get involved in this. That's why I'm always using the rest mass, the mass of the body uh, at rest in the system of coordinates where it's at rest. Okay. So, it looks, again, as part of that thing. And what's interesting thing is that what's really very, very tempting to say that this is the energy of the body which is basically at rest. This, the same thing with the Lorentz factor, uh, the same thing, the energy of the body, but it's not at rest, it's moving, which means it has both energy which it was before, which is uh, energy concentrated in, in, in the object at rest, plus kinetic energy. And that's why the difference between them, between the uh, total energy and the um, uh, energy of the uh, object at rest, is really the kinetic energy which we have just derived. 
it's tempting to say right now, and obviously physicists were thinking about this way. I am not going to prove it anything right now. I will leave it for um, next le next lectures. But basically, that's exactly where we are moving. We are moving towards the total energy and the energy of the body at rest. And obviously, the difference would be the energy of the movement itself. Movement adds the kinetic energy to the energy at rest, and that's why you have a total energy. But again, right now I'm not talking about this in any details, just mentioning this. Now, another thing which is very important is, now, you remember that the kinetic energy, uh, as defined in Newtonian mechanics, it's this one, right? By the way, I put T here. Now, T is the limit of the time I'm calculating. And we're talking about the energy of the body accumulated up to this time. But T can be anything. So basically, whenever you have just a, any kind of speed U, which is the limit speed. So we're considering that in the beginning, the body was uh, at rest. And then during some time, I can put any value. It accumulated certain speed up to this value. And this value would be basically the basis for calculating the kinetic energy. So I can just drop this dependence on time, just saying that whatever the speed is at the very end, at the very moment when we are interested in how much energy, kinetic energy the body has, that's the speed which we have to use. So it's obviously depending on something, on time or maybe on distance, which you. But whatever it depends on doesn't really uh, doesn't really matter. Whatever the point in time and space where we are measuring the speed would be the total kinetic energy using this formula, um, which body, which object actually is in possession of. Okay. Now the question is I, how they are related. Well, they must be related if the speed uh, of the object is really very, very small relative to speed of light. And that's absolutely true. Now, how can I prove it? Well, to prove it is very easy, actually. You have this gamma thing. This is gamma, right? So the whole thing can be uh, gamma times m0 c square minus m0 c square, which is gamma minus 1 m0 c square. That's what it is, right? Now, if you will take this gamma, which is 1 over square root of 1 minus u square divided by c square, and represent it in the Taylor series by the powers of u over c, that makes a lot of sense because in Taylor series you will have this thing as a first member in, in the first degree, then the second degree, the third degree, and the greater the power you raise u squared divided by c squared, the smaller it becomes, right? So we are assuming that u over c is a very small, and that's why I will just uh, use whatever I have done before. I'm very lazy. I did not really calculate it myself. I took it from the internet. So this is my first. This is my second. And I think this is my third, 5u to the 6. Um, I think it's 16 c to the 6. So you see, u square is very small. Now this one would be even smaller, and this one would be even smaller, etc. So what usually people do in, in these cases, when you, want, yeah, when you want to approximate, you basically cut off the tail, considering it's really very, very small, much smaller than this one, and you take only this one. So if you will replace gamma with this, what we will have? You will have 
gamma minus 1. So this one goes out, so you have only 1 u square c square times m c square. What do you have? 1 half mass times square. So, in red, if u is small relative to c, if the speed of the object is really small relative to speed of light, then this formula and this formula are very close to each other. So this can be used as an approximation in smaller um, speeds of object. And that's all I wanted to talk about today. So it's a kinetic energy. I have the formula for kinetic energy. And we have proven that this formula is corresponding to Newtonian when the speeds are really low. So I do suggest you to read the notes because the notes are much more detailed as far as the integration is concerned. Uh, but this is kind of technical details. I'm more interested in the approach rather than technicalities, which are just basically a matter of your basic knowledge of calculus and nothing more than that. Okay, so that's it. Thank you very much and good luck.